Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of uh, Eurohoops podcast, Eurohoop Pod. I'm Antonio Strogilakis. As usually, I'm joined by my great colleague, Cesare Milanti. And today we have another special guest or our guests are special. You can see him in front of you. European basketball veteran, Justin Cobbs, French League champion uh, in 2018 with Le Mans. He won the Montenegro League two times with Budutonost in 2021-2022. He also won the Croatian Cup with Sedevita. He won the, he won the Montenegro Cup also with Budutonost three times. He's played, the, he had quite the career in, uh, in Euro Cup and in domestic leagues. But strangely enough, never in Euroleague, Justin, right? Uh, and this yeah, is the team that made you um, kind of more famous recently because it became viral. It brought uh, a lot of reaction because it, it's an interesting question to raise, in my opinion. Right. Thank you for being with us, first of all. Do you said, do I agree with you? No, I, I, I say you thank you for being with us. I'm, I'm oh, well for sure, for sure. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Of course, of course. Was, I'm happy to be here, happy to be here. So before we move to, to your tweet, which raised a very interesting uh, topic, let's talk about your current whereabouts. You play for Cetavita right. Olympia right now, and you are in Spain, Badalona, where you face Jovedud. Tonight, yes. you, are, you guys are looking for your first win. Of course, when we, when we publish the podcast, we will know if you guys got your first win <laughs> or right. you didn't get the, the first. Uh, what's the status of the team right now? Uh, we're, 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 we're a team that's working. Uh, you know, we had a lot of problems. So, uh, you know, to, you know, to backtrack a little bit. So I think I got injured game three of Euro Cup, which, you know, kind of hindered us a little bit. Um, and then, you know, we had, you know, players changing. We had one player leave and privilege come in. And then we, you know, we had Carlo, Carlo Mactish, he got hurt. And now, she, you know, Sean Jones is hurt. So, you know, we had a lot of injuries. You know, there's no excuses for us to be in our current state but uh we're in a tough situation so but the team is good we're still working we're uh tied for a second or third and i believe i can't remember um so we're playing great domestically uh just you know just trying to get that first european win yeah you're you're tied with the uh, with partisan in the in the Abba league for the third position with a eight free record and that's kind of the paradox for you guys like you're getting important pretty important wins in the Abba league against teams like as i said partisan Buduknost was also a Euro Cup team, but you're right. you're you're still winless in the Euro Cup. So can you drive us through that? That what do you think is the is the matter with with this situation? Uh, I just think it's just think. I mean, you can't blame anyone but but yourself. Uh, I think just us as a team have to come together and you know just get the wins. Uh, like you said, we're playing getting the wins and you know Alba League and I think in, in Euro Cup. You know, obviously the the talent level is a little a little better. I would say, uh, but you know, we just have to come together and not figure it out. And I think. You know, we're getting better and better every week. And then hopefully we have, I think, eight more games in Euro Cup. We can we can squeeze out a few more wins and, you know, make the make the satisfaction of the season. Yeah. yeah I'm also looking at the scores. I'm looking at some, how many close games you lost. Yeah, exactly. And you could have gotten some big wins. For example, I was watching the full game in particular of, uh, of the Lotto Lions, I guess one of the best teams in Euro Cup. Right. right now. You had a good opportunity to win here, to win there, for example. Uh, you had a good opportunity to beat Jovedut at home. Yeah, yeah exactly. Closely. And I, I think uh, from what I've seen, Sedevita, your main issue is, to put it bluntly, a bit of naivety on the defensive end. Do you agree with mm -hmm. me? Yeah, of course. I think, um, you know, we can always get better on the defensive end. Um, I think at one point we were giving up just too many points, as you said. Uh, you know, easy transition points, not taking fouls when we needed to. But, uh, you know, we have a young team. I'm pretty, pretty sure you guys are experienced guys and understand. But we have a young team besides myself and Blasic that have played, you know, in different in, you know different levels of Europe. So, uh, you know, guys are learning. And like I said, our thing is to try to, you know, get those guys better every day and, you know, try to keep, you know, pushing forward. Let's move on to the tweet now. The tweet uh, <laughs> that you made, and it was... So, so it was it was a really good tweet because, as I said, it raised an interesting topic. And let's read it out. Uh, watching these Euroleague games got me thinking. I got to be the best player in quote marks to never play Euroleague. Check the numbers, check the winning percentage, the consistency, know of the court issues, etc. Let's debate 
I'm going to forgive the fact that you didn't tag us, Eurohoops. You, you tagged <laughs> a whole lot of other guys, but not Eurohoops. But let's surpass that. Let's let's talk numbers. Your career numbers in EuroCup. Great numbers. 12, 12.6 points, 4.4 assists, 12, uh, 2 rebounds, uh, a good number for a guard. In EuroCup over seven seasons, you appeared in four games. Let's talk about another level of competition. The World Cup qualifiers, great numbers there, 8.3 points uh, 18.3 points five assists 2.8 rebounds per game when Le Mans won the title in France in 2018 you yeah. were one of the best players on that team almost 14 points per game 5.8 assists 2.9 rebounds so we talked about the numbers some of the numbers some of the standout numbers you had throughout your career right what made you write that tweet at that moment tweeted was it something that was going on through your mind for a long period of time or was it just a thing of the moment right there uh it was kind of spread of the moment i always was a you know a basketball enthusiast but i always like you know things like this to talk about basketball and um and i just want to get other people's takes uh, a lot of times you hear you know things just maybe from your friends or from your colleagues or whatever but i was just you know throwing it out there and i knew maybe you know tagging these different people it would catch wind and then just, you know, just to debate basketball. This is, what, this is what my profession is. This is what I love to do. And then just to hear other people's perspectives to, you know, get an idea of, way, uh, you know, why, what they see that I might not see or, you know, vice versa. And I kind of, I got a little good feedback, you know, some, you know, obviously you got some trolls that just say anything. And then you have some people who really know basketball. And, um, That's a little bit for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they have a lot of good points. So uh, it was just, you know, spurred at the moment. And, um, it was just, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there. And I'm, I'm happy with the, you know, what, what happened and it caught wind. And, you know, I got good feedback from it. And, and considering, like, the, the topic of the tweet, why do you think you, you never played in the EuroLeague? Like, did, did you have any kind of contacts or, you know, uh, talks with EuroLeague club recently, in the past, or whatever? Uh, strangely, um, I, I can honestly say I don't think I've ever had any close uh negotiations with any any euro league team um uh i know um maybe the closest time was uh, when i was in Bedushnos. Uh, i had a two-year contract and i think the buyout was a little bit too much so it never was even in consideration um but yeah i never i never had any negotiations and wasn't even close so i can't even can't even say i had any interest from one euro league team in my career yeah in my eyes there are Two different categories in what you said. The best uh, player who never played in Euroleague, because I assume that you left NBA players. I, I assume you didn't. Of course, yeah, 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 of course. yeah, 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 yeah. Good, Let's make that clear. Of course, you didn't make Kevin Rudolph, but there are two different categories. There are the veterans who never played in Euroleague so far, like yourself, and there are the guys who who haven't played in Euroleague yet, but they're a bit younger than you. I'm thinking of TJ Short, for example. Yeah. If he continues playing like that and improving, then he's EuroLeague uh, uh, bound. But what I'd like to say is that we, we did our research, trust me. Okay. We okay. tried hard. And the fact that uh, it was so hard to find a player that can dispute what you said makes what you said kind of true. We, we, in the end, we agreed, both me and Cesare, we had a bit of a disagreement of the matter. <laughs> and, the only, and the only two players we agreed on was Mike Green, the all-time uh, EuroCup leader in assists, now, right. and uh, Tariq Kirksey, also a EuroCup uh, veteran. He had uh, he played mostly in Spain, so we can't find any any player. So yeah. maybe what you say is true, and uh, the thing is that uh, from one point onward, it seems to me that. Uh, Every player who is a steady contributor on Euro Cup or in basketball Champions league or in domestic league, they get their Euroleague opportunity. At least to play five games, six games, they get that thing. Why right. did you didn't get that? I can't. That's the, that's the answer I was looking for. That's why I put the tweet out. <laughs> that was the answer I was looking for, just to get, you know, different people, um, just to, you know, just to give me some clarity on what I've been, I've been trying to get answers for my whole career. Um, I just when I when we talk about these things in Europe, we talk about production, we talk about consistency, uh, winning percentage, um, and obviously no off the court issues. And I, I check off all those marks um, in Euro Cup. I'm always you know at the top top ten in PIR. Um, I, I draw the most fouls, and um, 
in Europe and, and, and since, since my whole career, uh, I shoot free throws at a high rate. I do a lot of things great. Um, I play defense. I'm not a small guard. I'm 6'3". So I can, you know, with the game changing and switching defense, I can I can switch and do those things. Um, but those are answers that me and you both, uh, I don't know if we'll ever get. Uh, well, I've never got the chance. But, uh, I mean, I, I think my play speaks for itself. I would hope so. Um, and I've been consistent my whole career. I've, you know, we just talked about the numbers and I just, you know, Hopefully one day I'll get that chance and we can figure it. We can maybe have some answers from there, but I don't know. That would be interesting. And considering considering like the the amount of things that you you talk about yourself, you, you your level, the type of player you are, uh, do you have any kind of teams in the current year league? Do you feel you could be particularly uh, you know great for that team, like a, a good addition, or would you find yourself uh, comfortable in in some situations. Uh, we can think of uh, one too, but we'd like to hear you first saying it. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, teams in particular, uh, you know, um, I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure of uh, any teams off the top of my head. So I, I would, you know, maybe let you guys say it and I, I, can, I can contribute from there. Well, I think the answer to the first is obvious. Alba, right? We, we agreed on Alba. Yeah. Alba, yeah. and I'm not saying it because Alba also needs a contributor, a scorer, uh, because they are last in the standings. But also because they are a young team. And what a young team needs. They have young forwards, young players. What better than a veteran? Right, right, showing right. the young guys how to do it a bit. Not veteran in the EuroLeague, but it's not like the other guys are well-traveled in EuroLeague that are now in Alba. Most of them right. are So Alba is a good um, team that uh, I'd like to think and also, just I was thinking Valencia. Yeah, like the the fact with Valencia is that it's heavily guarded. Like there are a lot of guards. It's Chris Jones, Martin, and Russell are returning. You know, still I I could I could see someone like Justin, you know, being a a veteran, extra helping hand. In in general, I think I think Sp a Spanish team would shoot you. It, <laughs> <that's what laughs> see. Yeah. Uh, a more uh, a more run and gun game, a more uh, a more free uh, game. What do you yeah. think? What kind of style is your favorite to play? Oh, uh, for sure, I can get up and down. Um, those, those are always the easiest games to play. Uh, you know the you know the fast paced games and and uh, up and down. But also the half court game is good. Uh, I'm, I've been playing pick and roll my whole career. Um, being obviously being a point guard, so uh, that also works for me. Also, so I, I think um. You know, looking at my career and playing in different countries, uh, that was another thing I think that was, that stood out for myself is I've played in, you know, Turkey, I've played in, uh, you know, Germany and, and all these places. And the, the production and the consistency always stays the same, which, you know, which shows my my versatility, I feel like, as a player. Um, you know, a lot of people can't, you know, translate from this system to that system. And I think that's Thank another, you. you know, a plus, you know, with my game is... Throughout my career, I've always showed versatility and being able to, you know, be able to show teams I can do multiple things, which, you know, not a lot of people can do. So I think I can fit in a lot of teams. It's just, you know, who's going to take the opportunity? Was, you know, we would have to wait and see. And considering other players, other names, maybe friend of yours or just guys that you like seeing, to, seeing play, uh, right. what, what are the names that comes to your mind uh, when thinking of, Guys who don't have a Euroleague opportunity uh, yet. Uh, it, it was only one guy that they brought up um, on Twitter when I put up the post was uh, Jacobin Brown. Um, you know, just given his, uh, you know, me watching him play this year in Euro Cup, uh, he, he started off amazing. I know they have a tough situation with the Israel thing. Um, but that was the only name that popped up that was like, okay, that, you know, that made sense. But other than that, a lot of people agree with me. And just like, just how we talked about this, there's not a lot of names out there. Let's, again, uh, not in the NBA, but um, of course. <laughs> yeah, let's just make that clear. Um, that, uh, like I said, I've been playing Europe for a long time. I haven't even just got a chance to say, okay, this guy can't play at that level. Like, you know, so as a basketball player, like I said, you know, we take pride in our game. We're all competitors. You just want to have the opportunity to say, we, we got to this level and we couldn't do it. And I just think, you know, given of what I've produced so far, I think I definitely deserve that opportunity. You know, funnily enough, uh, and uh, I was thinking about that, there are some players who didn't play in EuroLeague, but they played in EuroCup and the NBA. They never made it up to EuroLeague. Justin Hamilton, for example, who played <laughs> in Valencia, 
Then uh, he went to the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, he was previously on the Timberwolves. But right. uh, anyway, you said to yourself, you played in a lot of places, a lot of countries. And I like to hear that thought. Uh, US players always have uh, great, great stories to tell. What's the, what's the craziest thing that happened to you during your overseas career? I've heard those sort of crazy stories. Maybe maybe you have one, maybe you don't, but let's hear it. Yeah. Uh, the craziest, and it's not even too crazy. The craziest would just be the COVID time. So um, the COVID time, we were, I was in Baduchino's. And it was the, you know, uh, you know, we weren't playing at this time. Nobody knew what was going on. And it was, uh, and it was, um, and every everything shut down at this point. We were the last, I think, like one of the last teams to leave for the imports. And then so all the Americans are in the, um, you guys might even know about this. Uh, you got, uh, we were the last Americans, you know, in the room just talking. And our same thing, just how this tweet came out, I kind of panicked. And uh, the United States sent out a, a state of emergency, state like state four, state five. Hurry up and get back, or you guys are going to be stuck. So I sent out a tweet, same, similar to what just happened. I sent out a tweet like, "Hey, I'm an American, you know, I'm trying to get back home, X, Y, Z. Um, you know, how should I go about it?" And it went just crazy viral. And then I got a phone call from the from the pre, uh, from our president at Purdue, and so he was like, "Yes, you guys can go home." So we booked the flight that night. But the airport was closed, so we had to drive all the way to Albania, and we got on the last flight leaving to the United States. Mm. And, that, and that was the, so we almost got stuck in Montenegro. So that Wait, was, if, if you missed that flight, what would have happened? You would be stuck I, there? I would be stuck in Albania or in Montenegro. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah, so, so that was that was the craziest. Your family wasn't with you then? They were. They were. I had just my son. My son was with me, and my girlfriend was with me. Then. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not you know the, the, the crazy thing that we hear you know about some some local stories uh, payments etc but that's that's one memorable thing not for the for the good reasons at least yes yes yeah, yeah no payments is always you know pretty much you know pretty much fair of, of course you run into the typical european a little late but you know for me i've been i'm a vet i've been here 10 years so you know one week two weeks is normal and among the countries you 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 visited as a as a basketball player, you've been here. Uh, of course, there's Japan as well. Before coming yeah. to to Europe to Aba Liga to Sedevita, you were playing with the Alvar Tokyo. And uh, right. I remember uh, one tweet about, uh, from Ekpe Udo saying that Japan uh, must have been the most peaceful country he lived <laughs> in. And you yeah. quoted that and was like, "Yeah, you lo- I love it here." So tell us about that experience, the level of the of the Japanese league, the the, the talent of the players there, uh, potential. Yeah. Because we and how was it for you personally? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's it's just it's a different game. Let's let's just start with the basketball aspect. It's a different game. You have a lot of guys, you know, under under five eight, you know, super quick and really shoot the ball. And just the style of play is just different. So um, you know, they ISO from the elbow, not you know, not from the low post. Um, the the speed of the game is so much faster. It's less tactical, obviously, and more skill based. It's almost um I would compare it to like it's almost like entertainment, you know. It's um so it's like a real quick game. And then um as far as the people, they're super, super conservative, super nice, uh helpful. Um so it's just a you know, like a peaceful place. There's no trash anywhere on the ground in Japan, uh super clean. Uh technology is amazing. Um, but it's 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 a it's a great place to play and it's you know, the basketball is expanding and it's and it's gaining gaining crazy notoriety and you, now you see a lot of you know top Europeans are actually going to Japan to play I think uh Hassan Hassan uh, Martin is in uh Shimane uh so the, I think the kid from Zenit I, I don't know his name but he's on he's on Tokyo Arbark now uh but yeah a lot of, a lot of people are going over yeah yes you, yes 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 so a lot of people are going over there now yes they have uh an international Presence, uh, Seba size. I'm with right now. Uh, yeah. this man, guy. So we talked about uh, a, a kind of uh, an experience you want to forget. So you've been in many places. What's uh, excluding your current situation at the Vita Olivia, of course? What was uh, the happiest you felt uh, on a team? The most fun you had? Ah, uh, the most fun. I mean, I would have to just go back to my rookie year in Frankfurt. Uh, was really? the most fun. Yeah, just off the I didn't I didn't know anything about because it, it, for me it was different. I ne- I didn't know anything about Euro League. I didn't know anything about Euro Cup. 
I just, I just, I just was having fun playing basketball. It wasn't about the level. It wasn't about anything at that point. I was so young. So that was the first time it was just pure love of the game. It wasn't to reach this goal or to play on this team because I, I had no idea about it. So, um, and that's when everything took off. I think we ended up losing to Bayern Munich. We took them all the way to game five uh in the first or second round of the playoffs and it was just it was just pure you know for the love of the game it wasn't to prove as you know now that i'm playing it wasn't to prove that i should be on this level or to, or to be here it was just for the love of the game and and i think that that was my funnest year i said really in a surprising manner i was surprised because i i know that for for many u.s players for most u.s players coming to europe for the first time going away from home going away from their families to a different continent uh, Uh, well, from yeah. their girlfriends and all these thing, all these things, it's it can be a rude awakening. It can be yeah. wow, where where did I arrive right now? What I'm going to do? Where I'm going to spend my free time? Right. Uh, all these guys that I'm going to have uh, like a team is that it, it everything is so new, right? That uh, and this is the tough part of adjusting. I remember Malcolm Delaney says that he said us that he also had a good time in his uh, first year in Europe because. He was only interested in basketball. He said, I was playing, I was practicing, video games yeah. at home. Only sleep, basketball. Basketball, yeah. practice, video games, sleep, practice. That's it. But uh, but it still surprises me that uh, it, that your rookie year, it was so good for you. Because, you know, I, any U.S. players find it hard. Yeah, because so when you, I think, as I got older, it was more... Everything was winning base, and I wanted to prove that I should be here. I wanted to be on this team, and you know, after that, my my motives changed. You know, when I first got to Europe, it was I'm I'm a kid from Los Angeles, California, that's never been over here, just playing basketball, enjoying it for the love of the game. The money didn't matter, nothing, you know, none of this stuff mattered. But um, so it was it was more just a genuine love of, you know, just trying to compete and having fun. You know, what what we've been doing our whole life, which is playing basketball. So. That was that was uh, well, obviously, and then we had a great group of guys. Uh, I don't know, but we it was Mike, myself, Sean Armin, Danilo Bartel, uh, Giannis Volkman. Okay. We had a great, yeah, we had a great team. So a lot of these guys are now playing in great places. Um, you know, I know Danilo just retired. He, I think he had tough. He had some injuries with the knees, but yeah, from injury he, problems, he had to. He was forced to cut his career. Yeah, so. it was forced to cut his career, and then you know Giannis Volkman is playing amazing in Milan. Um, but and we had a great team, so it was it was it was fun time. Uh, also, uh, if if I remember correctly, Gordy Herbert was was coaching you yeah. guys, right? Gordy, so, yeah. Gordy, yeah. Gordy. Con considering the fact that, of course, he, he took Germany to bronze medal in the Eurobasket and then gold medal in the World Cup, what can yeah. you tell us about him as a coach, as a person? I always, um, always give uh, Gordy a shout out in every interview I do. Uh, we talk about because he gave me the opportunity for you know that that's gotten me to this career so far, and uh, yeah. Um, So he was a great coach. He let me play through my mistakes. He understood. And, you know, obviously he's Canadian, so he understood, uh, or he's from Canada. He understood, uh, you know, what I was going through, you know, being away from home, first time in Europe, I'm going to make mistakes. And and he let me learn, and he let me learn on the fly. And uh, we were able to have a great season that year. And, uh, I actually seen Gordy not too long ago. Uh, he was, uh, you know, obviously for the German Federation. I think we were playing Um when I was in Baduchno. So we had another same conversation, you know, similar to this. And uh, yeah, so like I said, I have nothing but positive thing to say about Gordy. Now let's move to, to EuroLeague before, because we also have some breaking news in a way. We talked about it before we begin with recording. And we have some right. updates on the matter. Uh, Fenerbahce coach Dimitris Dudis is out, apparently. Eurohoops has uh, confirmed it uh, as well as DNA from Greece first reported it. Just, uh, if I forget someone, tell me. Dusko Ivanovic out. TJ yeah. Parker out from Aswell. It this is the third coach yeah. who gets fired in the season so far. And uh, yes. it's still 2023. It's, it's still the first leg of the Euroleague regular season. A cut also, also, Scariolo was coached, was before fired the right before the, the start <laughs> of the Euroleague season. So, yeah. You know. Just yeah. uh, you know firsthand how cutthroat European basketball business is, right? Right, for sure, for sure. If you don't produce, if you don't get results immediately, yeah, there is little patience sometimes. You ever felt that as a player, this side of the business in Europe, which is so much different from uh, what happens in the ABA, for example, there, there is little patience here. You have to produce. You have to abide by. Certain strict rules sometimes. Yeah. If you don't, 
then there may be trouble. Yeah, so it's it's just the nature of the beast. Um, you know, there's a lot of good players out there now. You know, Europe is kind of a they want it now product. Uh, so there's no there's no waiting. There's you know there's no you know so you have to go out there and producing and get it done at an early you know at an early rate because if you don't you know there's there's a mini pool of players that are looking to take the opportunity. Um, so I've experienced it um, just one time in Turkey. Uh, I was released in Turkey after I think about seven games, uh, and this is when I uh, came. That's when I went to Bayern Munich after uh, uh, after that. After uh, this couple, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, that that was my one time experience in it, and um, and yeah, so I, I was on the short end of the stick of that time, and that was the first time I understood the business and understanding that hey, you have to go out there and be ready and produce regardless of the team results. You have to make sure you show it the club and organization that, you know, you're a piece that they can build around or with. And uh, what do you think of of this move? Like the, the fact that Fener sacked the two this, what do you think of the team as of now? We know that you're you're following EuroLeague action yeah. pretty closely. So uh, I, I just I just think you know, like I said, with the European market, especially at that level with the budgets they have, um, you know, they expect the product to be, you know, at a high level. And so so losing for them is, is kind of not acceptable when, you know, you're spending that kind of money and you have that type of budget and you have those players. So, uh, you know, you kind of can understand it, but I, I, I see both ends, you know, of the of the stick. Because obviously sometimes, you know, a coach can't play, you know, so the players, you know, obviously they have to play. So uh, you can't put all the blame on the coach. But I understand, I understand, you know, because like I said, you, you invest this money into your product and you expect to see, you know, a nice, a nice, beautiful play. And then when you don't see that, it kind of, it kind of can make you feel a type of way, maybe, which will lead to a change. And, um, you know what, uh, when, um, when Joel, Joel Bolon boy now playing at, as Vesda Rev, Dr. Libyakos, and he was coming from Ceseca Moscow, coached by two this, and he's moving to Libyakos, and Libyakos also has a lot of systems. They have a great tactics team. And Bolon boy says to me, yeah, we have system, but it's unlike anything we had at Ceseca. So yeah. imagine how, uh, what kind of exercise they had at Ceseca truly with the Tuvis on board. Right. Yeah, uh, Fenerbahce, maybe they, they decided that uh, they needed change. They were coming off uh, consecutive EuroLeague uh, losses. They lost, even though they beat Real Madrid, they, they, they were the only team that beat Real Madrid in EuroLeague this season. Yeah. They lost to Basconia, they lost to Barcelona, and they lost to a very short-hearted Anadolu FS in yeah. the Turkish League. So that was the icing, perhaps, that. Yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes the coach can't get the players to, to react how he likes. So sometimes you need you need a coach and change. You know, coaches can get different players to react in different ways. So maybe, you know, maybe it was time. Who knows? Who do you like in the EuroLeague, Justin Cobbs? If you, if you had to pick right now for, for let's say, the top, uh, the final four teams, I know it's early, many things can't change. And uh, usually it's about the team that survives this marathon. It's not about who is the fastest sprinter. In the beginning, right. it's about the team that is the best when the finishing line comes. Who would you pick? Well, I like Madrid just because Tavares has a cheat code, uh, seven five, and then you have Capasso with him and and Musa. Uh, they're just like a well oiled machine, and you have a you know a bunch of guys that played together for ten, seven, you know, seven to ten years together. They like it's like clockwork. I don't know it, the, the other play went viral. Uh, I think. Uh, Tacho threw it to Portier, you know, Portier threw it between his legs, he just threw it behind his head. So insane. It's just, yeah, that it's, just, insane. So, it's just a well-oiled machine. They, they move the ball together, they know where each other are. It's just, you know, something you can't teach. It just, you know, it just happens. And I think that they're one of those teams that they just have that that factor, that it factor. If they don't, they have that that chemistry together that a lot of teams don't have. So I think that's a plus for them. And then adding to Morris and Capasso and it makes this, it's a pretty tough team to beat. And talking about players, uh, we we saw doing our research that you're pretty close with uh, Mike James and Kevin Potter. You're you're uh, they're like sending messages and love to each other. Uh, so yeah. what do you think of the of the performances of those two guys? Of course, we know that KP just came back from a from a pretty long injury. But what, yeah. what's your opinion on those on those seasons? Considering that Mike is a MVP candidate at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, so Mike always been for me. He was always been one A, one, and then you know KP is one B for me. Our best players in Europe, but Mike's been doing it for a long time, scoring the ball at a high rate. And um, 
the way you know he has Monaco playing right now is great. Uh, you know, showing he could be a passer too. You know, I think he had a few games with over ten assists. Uh, you know, when teams take him out of the game. So uh, again, he's just showing versatility and showing he can. He's still playing at a high level and, and been doing it for a long time. And with KP also, you know, coming off an injury and uh, taking that partisan team from Euro Cup to now last year to the final four and. Um, um, in Euroleague to now, I think they're tied for six in Euroleague uh, currently. Uh, yeah. But just taking and take taking that many team teams from, that are tied. Yeah, yeah, I know it's it's, it's pretty tight. But um, yeah, taking them from you know, uh, I think they were struggling at first, to now just running off a few wins. It's it's it's, it's good to see. And um, with them, those guys being close friends, or, you know, it's it, you wouldn't you wouldn't want anything else for them to be successful. Do you think that this is his season, Mike? I was uh, doing a sort of video for um, for our TikTok uh, channel, and that was a moment he was leading Monaco, okay, in scoring and passing, but also rebounds. Yeah. It's crazy. At that moment, yeah. he was leading the team in rebounds. He was doing everything. And we're talking about a Monaco team that um, doesn't have, is not a very, doesn't have a high pace. Their offenses are long, they drag a bit, but yeah. still, Mike produces a lot of numbers. He's He's completely carrying the team, the team at this moment because Jordan Lloyd hasn't uh, fully returned to form after his right. absence. And do you think that this is the season that Mike James wins MVP finally? And uh, what's your opinion also on this? Because you know that Euroleague, if uh, the, if your team doesn't go to the final four, then you are out of the question, out of consideration for MVP. Do you agree on this? And do you think that James? Uh, uh, I don't. I mean, I don't think that because it's. I mean, when you look at MVP, MVP means most valuable player. So who's the most valuable player and is contributing at a high rate? So um, you know, but that's that's the, that's neither here or there. That's that's their situation. But I think Mike James is definitely a, a candidate. Uh, like I said, he's a one of the best shot makers in Euro League. Um, you know, one of the best clutch clutch players in Euro League. And uh, like I said, you look at consistency. You look at somebody who's done it year after year after year after year, putting up great numbers. And not also putting up great numbers, but winning games. So when you look at those factors, it's it's like almost why not has me one one. And uh, of course, as we as we talked a lot, you you never had the opportunity to face Zvezda or Partizan in the Euroleague, but you experienced the the crazy atmosphere of Stark Arena or the Alexander Nikolic all in the Abba Liga. Right. So. Yeah. What's like? Do you do you believe there's some kind of differences in the way, like maybe the effort or like the atmosphere itself, the kind of play game they have in the Euroleague and in the Abba League, considering the fact that you face them in that in the domestic competition? Uh, for me, I could say I w- just for for their sake, I would say yes in the regular season, but also I played them in the playoffs for I was a producer of three years and uh, well, yeah, three years and. Set of Vita year for four years, so I've played these teams also in the playoffs when it's a trophy on the line, and you know we've also been able to grab wins on the road or grab wins at home. So um, you know, so regular season I'll give them a pass and say, okay, you're you're, you're saving yourself for your your league, but in the playoffs is all bets off. It's it's time to you know put your your best five out there and try to win the game. And so I've been successful on you know both spectrums in the regular season and in the playoffs. So. If if you know in a regular season you guys were weren't a hundred percent, I can give you that. But in playoffs, I've also got victories also. So I can't I can't call it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are almost uh, done, uh, Justin. And the last thing we want to ask you is uh, that um, we read. I couldn't find, for the love of me, I searched everywhere. I couldn't find any more information about that about your relationship with uh, Russell Westbrook. The only thing oh, yeah. that I found that you have in common is that you were born both born in Los Angeles, different correct, correct. Los Angeles. And that's correct. the thing. So uh, tell us about that, if you can, please. Um, so obviously, Los Angeles is a big city, and also yeah. playing basketball. Um, you know, at, at this age, I think Russell's thirty-four. Uh, I know a lot of these guys, so. Uh, so I think um, so. When we were younger, we were you know a little a little more closer because obviously I was in the states and things like that. Uh, but you know you you know you when you know when as an American when you guys are close, you be like, hey this is this is my brother or this is my cousin type thing. So it was kind of that relationship. And I think somebody maybe wrote on Wikipedia like Justin Cobb is Russell Westbrook's cousin, which wasn't true. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, so that that was just a thing that was going around for a while. But like uh, yeah, I know a lot of these guys: Demar Derozan, James Harden. 
uh, Kawhi Leonard, uh, Russell Westbrook, um, all these guys are, are friends of mine. Just you know, for the simple fact that we're we're in this mix, we are in this big mixing pot of basketball players, and and we played at we play at UCLA during the summer. Uh, we've played against each other in high school, so I've, I've been knowing these guys since I was 11, 12 years old. Did you beat any of those guys? Did you tell us that you broke uh, Russell's Westbrook uh, ankles in a pickup or something? Please <laughs> tell us that nah, you did that sometime. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't say that. I can't say that. But I've definitely, we definitely had times, you know, playing at UCLA, just competing, having fun. Um, you know, it's it's always been good times playing against those guys, seeing where you where you match up against, you know, some of the best talent in the NBA. You need you need All to right, bring that, some you need okay. to bring some some triple doubles to to Celevida to to be like Mr. Triple yeah, that, Double. That's, that's so rare. That's, <laughs> hey, if we had these, these big guys rebounding, I might be able to grab some. But if, you know, the game's a little different over here. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, triple double. Many people don't don't realize it in uh, in America. It's so so rare in Europe. So rare. You're, it's a different it's a different game. Like I, like I said, people don't understand. They see these NBA guys come over. That should be another topic you guys should have. These NBA guys come over. How many have successful successful rates? And it's and it's not a lot. A lot of guys, you know, come from the NBA and they they really really struggle. And they struggle to adjust. Not just because I can think. I don't want to, to drop any particular names as well, but I can think of many. Truly, I can think of many players who arrived in Europe. Okay, they weren't superstars in the NBA, of course. Yeah, right, 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 right. Solid. You know, they were veterans from eight years, and out of all of a sudden. It's like who are these guys? Are they exactly. are they are they good at playing basketball? They are they are so they're like fishes out of the water in a way. They <laughs> they they struggle to adjust. They, they, maybe they can't handle the pressure, the atmosphere, the must win situation of yeah, exactly. the European thing, the cultural thing that we mentioned before. Uh, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, that's a, that's a interesting uh, topic indeed. Since you since you mentioned it, since you raised it, what's the biggest? problem for you that a U.S. guy, a veteran in the NBA might have when he comes to you? What's the most difficult thing to adjust? Is it the rules? Is it the life? Is it the pressure? Because there are a lot of different things. Uh, I would say two things. I would say one is the spacing. The spacing is totally different. There's no three seconds. And once you blow by your man, it's it's a clear dunk. If you're athletic, you you know, it's showtime. You, you're, going, you're going to dunk. But over here, you beat your man. It's help side. It's help side waiting for you. Um, and then also, I would say just to value every possession. In, in the NBA, it's okay to, you know, turn the ball over in the fourth quarter. You know, you got maybe 30, 40, you know, 30 more possessions to go. But, you know, in Europe, every possession matters. You turn the ball over and that team go on a run and the crowd start getting into it. Those things matter in Europe. So I think, you know, those are things that you don't, you don't have to worry about in the NBA. Everyone mentions the three seconds. Everyone, everyone mentions the three seconds. Yeah. It's it's big. It it's really makes a difference, it, you know, because you got to think you beat your man and you got Tavares behind you. It's it, it's OK. But in the NBA, Tavares has to take a step outside the paint. So maybe he can't get there. And if you have a, your guy with a 40 inch vertical or, you know, 39 inch vertical, you can you can dunk it before he gets there. But you can't you can't do that when he's sitting there waiting for you all enough. So it's a different game. So essentially, if a, if a EuroLeague team had to go Bert, it's over. Oh, that's I'm telling you, Tavares is a cheat code. Okay. He, yeah, yeah, it's over. It's over. Tavares, yeah, the Tavares is huge. And this is the crazy thing about Real. They, they have the cheat code, the cheat code on the big men, and they have, and then now they got the cheat code. Like I'm <laughs> so, Yeah, I already knew it was coming. Uh, yeah, the, he's a, yeah, not, another one that they work so well together. So they have a, like I said, that's that's the well oiled machine in Madrid. So I I expect them to do great things in the playoffs. Justin, I think we are we covered all the topics we want to talk to you. We are really appreciated being with us, and I want sure. to publicly say it. Thank you for for agreeing to do it with us. It was a very short notice that we, yeah. that we gave you and we notified you. Uh, thank you uh, to all of our uh, viewers. You can catch up uh, with uh, Justin in the Euro Cup, of course. Uh, by the time we are recording this podcast, uh, Justin uh, and Cedevita would have played. In uh, the uh, Badalona, I guess you would Badalona on the road, but plenty of games ahead, and also in the ABBA League primarily. Justin, good luck. Thank you, guys. Great talking to you guys, and uh, we'll talk soon on the DM and stay things like that. So, you guys take care. Thanks okay, for being with luck, us. Justin. Good luck tonight. For sure, for sure. Season. Cesare, uh, thank you again. And thank from, you. Uh,
from Adorso Glakis and Cesare. That was uh, another episode of Eurohoops Eurohoop Pod podcast. You can find, the, of course, the episode on YouTube, on Spotify, and on other platforms. Farewell, everyone, and take care. Take care. Ciao.